Okay, so hello everybody. Thanks for bearing with me as I got things uh, got things started and then got set up. And bear with me just a moment longer because I'm on the wrong. There we go. Okay, so hi. <laughs> My name is Michael Hanscom. I'm the program manager for Accessible Technology. I got started here last December, so I'm approaching a full year here at Highline. I'm happy to be here with all of you. <laughs> this is really funny within almost every room. Um, so my role as the program manager for Accessible Technology is to make sure that uh, students can access the information they need to access, uh, whether that's college information or classroom information, and that faculty and staff uh, have the tools and knowledge they need to make that information accessible to students. Um, the basic elevator pitch is I make sure your jobs are safe because Highline isn't getting sued under ADA regulations. So that's what a lot of it boils down to. And um, I'm a science fiction geek and a Star Trek fan. So if you uh, ever join me on Zoom and while I'm in my office, you'll see the Star Trek stuff behind me. If you ever run into me around campus and just want to start a conversation, uh, just general geek stuff is a great conversation starter. Um, so first off, why are we doing this? Um, a lot of it, uh, part of it boils down to you have disabled students in your classes that you don't know about. Uh, statistically, we know that, let's see, I have it in my speaker notes, which don't show on this screen, so I'm going to have to try and do this off the top of my head, but I think around 20% of uh, community college students uh, so, uh, identify as uh, having a disability one sort of or another, but only about 5% of them actually disclose that to the school, which tells us that there's a lot of students with disabilities that we don't know about, either as a department or just as a school, they're in your classes. So whether or not you know they're in there, um, making, making sure your material is accessible is gonna help a lot more students than you might need to know. Students don't need to be disabled to benefit. Um, there are a lot of accessibility measures that come in very handy for, for everyone. Um, a very common one these days is captions on videos. Um, they're, they're not just for the hard of hearing. There are many, many people who get benefits from captions. Um, English language learners, people in distracted situations. Um, when I heard uh, just uh, parents who are trying to watch classroom videos while their uh, students are doing things. I mean, while their children are doing things around the house, playing, make a lot of noise. There are all sorts of situations where subtitles and many other accessibility measures can help. Create, because these are required, as I'll get to in just a couple of moments, creating with accessibility in mind saves time when accommodations are needed. If you plan for accessibility as you're creating your documents, as you're creating your classes, then you're not going to have to scramble when all of a sudden you get the letter of accommodation from a student saying, hey, I need this, and you're stuck looking at all of your information going, great, now I've got to get this done immediately. You plan for that from the start, and it's a lot easier on you. It's a legal requirement, which is, goes back to where I entered with, uh, you know, we make sure we don't get sued. Um, both the federal and state requirements, uh, uh, state laws require that we have, uh, make, make, our, uh, make everything accessible, as accessible as possible, and all, uh, more information on the exact wording of all the laws and everything, if you're curious and want to dig into the legalities, is available from the State Board of Community Technical Colleges. They have a library, an accessibility library that's linked here, which doesn't do a whole lot of good right away, but this uh, presentation will be downloadable um, at the end. So, more specifically, in the recently ratified uh, collective bargaining agreement, there is new accessibility language. Um, these are just excerpts. This is not the exact wording, but I kind of shortened it down a little bit to fit on the slide. And 304.1 uh, says that all course uh, syllabi posted in Canvas must meet federal accessibility requirements. And then 304.3, electronic content. So that's going to cover, you know, pretty much uh, these days, just about anything, especially if you're teaching online or hybrid. Electronic content must meet accessibility requirements by the third quarter after summer quarter 2022 in which they're used unless a letter of accommodation means it needs to be done earlier. Basically, just as a college, we have decided that, yes, we're going to make sure things are accessible. And uh, so um, we all were very kind enough to let this get past the bargaining and into the final agreement. So thank you very much for that. We really appreciate, we really appreciate that you did that. 
So when it comes to syllabi, we're trying to make this as easy as possible. For a while, um, Blue Highline has provided an inclusive syllabus template. Uh, we have gone in, uh, just, uh, hold on just a moment. I am letting another couple of people in. One and two it brings us up to 15. So welcome. Um, I'm just uh, starting to go through some of the resources that we have available when you're planning for accessibility in classes. So we're trying to make the, the creating your syllabus as easy as possible. For a while, Highline has had an inclusive syllabus template. We've recently gone through and updated this to make sure an access it's an accessible so, uh, inclusive accessible and inclusive syllabus template. Um, it's available on the let's see, uh, it's available from the LTC. Well, it's linked here. Again, you'll be able to download that later. It's available on the LTC Highline.edu website. It's available on the Highline.edu slash accessibility site, or you can search for Highline inclusive syllabus template. And you're going to find it. Um, basically, it makes the syllabus as easy as we can make it. Uh, just you've got the template ready to go. You can just cut and paste, put your information in, and um, you know that you're going to have a very good accessible starting point. Yes, uh, we, absolutely. Hi, welcome. Come join us. I think that 15 participants online. Oh, and I tried to get in. And oh, but I was probably and, I, I'm. Oh, here I am. Probably yeah, yeah. sorry about that. Okay, so um, give me just a moment. I I've had someone in the chat ask for a, a, a link to the template in the chat. I can get that quite quickly. Let's see. And actually, easiest way is just at the LTC website. I'll give you that, and then I'll also, because it's the second bullet point on that website, or I can just drop you into the Google Doc itself. And if the Google Doc should be set up, aha, thank you, Helen, I see that. Um, the Google document is set up so you can just make a copy of it and then just start dropping things in. And uh, uh, it has instructions included in it. Um, and then uh, as long as you stick to that template, uh, you should be good to go. Plus, it has a lot of other information about the things that Highline wants included in, in the syllabus. So, so, that's, uh, so that's a wonderful starting point for new syllabi. Um, if you have syllabi already created and you just want to update them, um, you're certainly free to do that. Uh, we still might recommend taking a look at this template just to make sure you have all the required information in there. And if you're getting something old, then it might just take paying a little more, uh, paying some attention to um, to accessibility standards, which I'm going to make uh, do a quick run through of momentarily. So, going to start by going over just some basic document uh, document accessibility tips, because there's a lot of stuff that, after a while, as you get used to it, it can become second nature. But if you don't know about it, it's been, it might be brand new. So, for some of you, this might be brand new. For some of this, this might be uh, a bit of a refresher. Um, you might, uh, and we'll see how much, we'll see how that goes. So uh, one of the first things is using style to define headings. And I'll show you, uh, I'll uh, show you a screenshot in a moment to make that a little bit more clear. But basically, if you're typing a document and you're dividing into sections and you just grab a line for a heading and you say, okay, I'm going to make that bold and I'm going to make that 14 point or 18 point. And so it stands out. Well, it only stands out if you can see it, if you're using a screen reader or technology like that, then because all you've done is format it, the screen reader has no idea about the actual structure of the document. It can't give the screen reader user any information. It can't stand through and say, here are the different headings. So it only it, so that only works for visual uh, for sighted users. So um, yes, we have a question here. If I create heading four, let's say, yes. and it comes out a certain size, I can still change the size and make yes. it bold and that doesn't change the screen reader at all. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So the question was, if you uh, use styles and you want to make them look different than the defaults that Word or Google Docs includes, if you change if you change the way those are formatted, um, can you do that? And yes, absolutely. Um, you don't have to use the, the, the styles, the default way to come out of it. Um, so, not, so basically, adding styles creates structure within the document. 
And then a really easy way to tell whether you have a document with or without structure is to use the document outline view. In Word, there's a show the navigation pane option. In Google Docs, the view menu show outline. And just a quick look at what those look like. In Word, it opens up the panel here on the left-hand side that just as, as a quick little outline view of the entire document. So if you go to if you go to view and the navigation pane, and then you don't see anything here, you know you've got no structure. And, and you know that a screen reader is just gonna learn, just just gonna read a bunch of information, but it's not gonna be separated in any way. If you've got the structure as you see it here. You know that your doc, uh, you know that the screen reader will be able to have a lot more information about what's in your document. This is the same thing under Google Docs. Again, you turn it on and it opens up the, the sidebar on the side of the outline view of the document. Okay, nothing in the chat yet. And, and as I'm going, feel free to toss if you have questions as I go through, feel free to toss questions. I will check the chat every so often and uh, hopefully I won't miss it or leave you hanging terribly long. So when you are using headings, yes, uh, <laughs> we just got a, uh, uh, oh, okay, that's interesting. Basically, um, in, in Word and in Google Docs, uh, both one of, the, uh, one of the very most prominent things you see in the style bar is a title style. Ignore it, pretend it doesn't exist. Um, there are complicated reasons, which I could get into if you really want, or if after we're done, you download the, the, this PowerPoint, I've got, uh, I have the reasoning crammed into the speaker notes. So you can see it there if you're really curious about the easy back end side of things. But basically just ignore the title style. It does you no real good. Every document should have one and only one heading one as the title of the document. And then all other heading structures should cascade down from there, headings two, three, four, and so on. And then just make sure that you don't skip levels. A heading two shall be followed by a heading three, then a heading four. Don't jump among those. It, it can get a little bit confusing if someone's jumping through the structure of a document and they have a heading four, but there's no heading three. So now they don't know if it's if it's supposed to be there, if something weird went on. And it just makes it a little bit more confusing. So make sure your structure maps the way structure show. Lists. Um, want to make sure that you're when you're creating lists, you're actually creating lists using the built-in tools rather than just using a little dash at the beginning of the line or a uh, or a dot or a star at the beginning of the line. Now these days, Word uh, and I think Google Docs also is usually pretty good about picking it up on if on if someone's using that shortcut and automatically turning it into a list. Um, but just in case, you know, make sure that the li the list option has been used or numbers, uh, however you like to do it. Again. This is for screen reader users because the screen reader will say, I'm entering a list. This is a list that has 15 items in it. You're on item number one, you're on item number two. It'll read all this stuff out as the user is working with their way through the document. And again, if that doesn't exist, then the, then the screen reader, it may be reading out the numbers one dot one, whatever the information is, two, whatever the information is. But there's no further information and it doesn't give the user the ability to jump back and forth among uh, the list items or within the documents. And that's true for bullets too. Not yes. Like it'll read bullets like numbers. Yes. It, uh, well, it, it, it's a bullet, this item bullet. Uh, yes. The question was whether it reads the same way for bullets as lists as well as ordered lists. And it's similar just as bullets instead of numbers. Tables. Um, tables should only be used for data. Um, um, there's a long-standing habit of saying, well, I want the, uh, uh, the picture over here and the, the information over here and throwing a table into your document uh, to make sure that, that works out. And that just, it's a mess. Uh, it really does not work well. In large part, again, we're going back to screen readers. As they're going through, uh, uh, um, the screen reader will read a page going, uh, and it'll say something like table. Table row one, cell one information, table row two, cell data. Uh, so, uh, and I'm, I mean, uh, you get the point. I'm stumbling at this point, but it reads its way. And the intent is to let the user know okay, this is a table, and here you are, this is where you are within the table, and this is the information at that point. But now, if you're using the, the, the table for layout, it just becomes an auditory mess, and it becomes much, much harder to keep track of the actual information. When you're also trying to, okay, just ignore the fact that it's babbling me about a table. Um, try not to merge or split cells. Again, it just it's just keeping the, the table as simple as possible. 
and define the header row. I've got the screenshot here showing the header row option in Word. And basically, uh, again, uh, uh, when screen reader is reading a table, it, it will say something like um, column one, first name, column two, second name. And then as if, if a screen reader user is navigating through the document, it's able to use that to, 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 to make sure the user knows that even if they're somewhere down in like seven, eight, 10, 20, whatever, that sells down in document, they, they can still trigger that, okay, this, this column is the first name column or the last name column or the address column or anything like that. But it needs to have that header row information defined in order to do that. Yes, I'm ahead. coming with lots of questions. Questions are very great. specific project. Yeah, yeah, questions are great. Um, so I understand that you don't want picture and words in two columns, but what about in a single cell? There's a picture and words. Um, again, it's it. Well, it kind of depends. The question is, it's um, like doing something like putting a picture and words within a single cell of a table. Um, I would really, there's, I, I can't give a quick answer to this. I would say I would need a little more information on like, why is that in the, why is that being used in the table that way? Again, if you're, if, if you're using the table to push your layout of the documents into a particular way, there may be better ways to do that that don't involve tables. Okay, so we should talk. Yes. I yeah, we can get into the nitty gritty later. Some of us that needs pictures. Okay, no, yeah. there's nothing wrong with pictures yeah. at, at all. Yeah. <laughs> it's just how you're incorporated. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and what if this applies to Google Docs? Um, so, question in the chat from Helen uh, what if this applies to Google Docs? Um, essentially, everything. Um, the, with, though many of the screenshots I'm, uh, I grabbed are from Word uh, because, um, <laughs> because that's what I was using at the moment. Um, the, 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 what the actual information I'm giving you is, is, uh, is concepts basically and, and best practices. Um, the, the individual way to do things uh, may differ between Word and Google Docs, but the concepts are the same either way. Hopefully that answers what you were getting at. Okay, wait. So, okay, I was thinking about table functionality in Google Docs. Um, uh, yes, um, the header functionality is in there, I know. Um, I would have to sit and stare at Google Docs to be sure of the exact uh, methodology for getting to one thing or another, but yeah, absolutely. Okay, when we're getting the links, um, and this often depends on uh, when you're creating a document, if you especially, you might want to put some thought into a uh, document, are you preparing the document for print? Or for online use, because the, some of the, the, these concepts may change a little bit depending on that. Uh, depending on that, um, but especially when you're creating documents for electronic use, links should be hyperlinked. They shouldn't just be a string of text, um, and they should use descriptive text. It shouldn't be just, as I have in the second example here, taking this big long string of, of characters and then turning it into a link. Um, you think visually, well, people know where they're going, sure, but, you know, imagine sitting there and you're coming through here with a screen reader, and the screen reader is telling you, read the WCAG 2.1 guidelines at HTTPS colon slash slash www dot, I'm going to stop there because it gets really annoying really quickly. <laughs> By using descriptive text, such as the, at the bottom where I just would say read the WCAG link uh, 2.1 guidelines and that text is linked. That makes sure uh, that it's you know much easier to process when you're listening to it. Um, just a quick moment. Um, it also makes sure that the the user knows where they're going and what the link leads to. And part of what I say right above this is not using click here or more info. Again, when you're using a screen reader, one of the options you have is to quickly scan through a document. Just like if you were reading a document, you might scan through and look for the colored and underlined text. Say, okay, there's a link, there's a link, there's a link. You might, if you're looking for particular information. Screen reader can do the same thing. And what it'll do is it'll say link, and then it'll read what the link is. But if you've got a document and it says link, click here, link, click here, link, you're not giving, you're not giving the user any information about where they're going. Or instead, if you were to say, or if you're doing the same thing and it said link WCAG 2.1 guidelines, link Highline College website, link the White House website, or something along those lines, 
at each point you're getting you're giving the user information about where that link is sending them. And another question. Yeah, we got been thinking about the bottom one where yes. you got the thumbs up to describe to not make the assumption that people know what it means to click on that thing with an underline. Couldn't we say click to read the WCAG and have the whole thing be the link? You could. Because you could. Um, the, uh, the question, uh, I think, I think the audio picked up some of that. But the question was, could you do something like linking the entire text, click to read the guidelines, and instead of just linking that piece? So you could. But then again, thinking about the user experience of, so, of, of a screen reader, you might end up in a, in a position where there they might be reading through and they're getting uh, link, click to go here, link, click to go here, link, click to go here. Oh, yes, I, I'm sorry, that was me. That was me using um, um, auditory shorthand. But link, uh, go to the guidelines, uh, link, link, click to go to the Highland College website. Basically, you end up getting that auditory click to at the beginning of everything, and it just becomes redundant. Um, I think there are other reasons too that I am not grabbing off the top of my head, but the general recommended best practice is to just link what you're going to without too much extraneous information beyond that. And I'm you. just wondering if, um, because you're thinking about, you know, your pre lit level one, maybe they're not used to using technology. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah, not just those levels. That's it, right? You know, they don't know that they can click on that thing. Very explicit instructions about just navigating yeah. separate from yeah. your document itself. Uh, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, I'd say it's not necessarily a, a bad thing to do as long as you have descriptive text. The descriptive text can be verbose. No, I get that. Yeah. And I think yeah. what I'm hearing is have a tech lesson around clicking on links. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they're everywhere, right? <laughs> okay. So white space. Um, uh, use page breaks or paragraph formatting to add no multiple blank lines to add white space. A lot of times, if you get to the end of a section and you know you're just a couple inches from the end of the page and you don't want to, you don't want to wrap it, you just go here, yeah, return, 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 return. Um, well, the screen reader might read that out, yeah. and um, so yeah, a lot of blank space again is just one of those. This one, it, it's just kind of being nice to your reader. <laughs> so they don't have to sit there and listen to the screen there and go blank, blank, blank. Um, so those are, okay. <laughs> We're getting in the chat. Yes, please use page breaks. Your overall document formatting will thank you too. Yes, this is very true. <laughs> so those are just a lot of the most common basic accessibility things to keep in mind as you're creating documents. And those and I focused on Word and and, uh, and Google Docs, but they also uh, the, the concepts also apply to if you're in PowerPoint or if you're in Excel. Uh, or obviously, Excel has tables, so it, it changes things a little bit. But basically, anytime you're creating a document, these are it's just good um, basic ideas to keep in mind as you create them. Once you're done, and once or or once you think you're done. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, just make sure to run your document through an accessibility checker. And there are uh, different, slightly different ways to do this depending on the environment you're in. In Word, it's the review toolbar and then check accessibility. And it'll just go through, scan the document, look for the most common uh, accessibility errors, and let you know what they are. In this uh, particular example, um, oh no, I had an image that did not have any alt text. Which I'm just realizing I forgot to put in my tips. So, so this is a good one. I'll just the tangent for just a moment. When you have images in your documents, make sure that they have alt text applied to them. Um, alt text is basically a short description of the content in the image. Um, and the best way to think about this is how is the image um, is the image conveying information that you that you need or want the students to know. And that could be in a bunch of different contexts. Um, for instance, if it's a if it's a diagram or an illustration of something, you want the alt text to give a short description. It doesn't have to be super in depth, but at least the the main information that the that the students would need to glean from that image. Um, you can also have you also have the option of just marking an image as decorative if the if it's just if that's all it is. But something to think about in that matter is, the, the, I, I just uh, was talking to someone about this the other day, is that some, 
you don't need to think of decorative as not directly applying to the content. Um, like uh, there was someone who was uh, creating a document and they had a little cartoon just to break things up and make things funnier. And they had been marking those as decorative so that screen reader users maybe weren't getting confused or weren't, weren't getting sidetracked. But then we started talking about it. And it's, but at that point, you're depriving them of the same information that the science students are getting. And even if it's not directly applicable, if it's not you know, course information, still, you know, you're giving it to your other students who are going to you know, lighten the mood a little bit, give them something to laugh at. There's no reason not to give that to, to students using a screen reader as well. So decorative is really good for things that really are decorative. Like you've got a pretty little uh, set of autumn leaves because it happens to be the fall. That might be a good decorative image. But don't think that you have to mark everything as decorative is if it doesn't directly apply. Coming back to the accessibility checker, it'll um, so it'll just go through your document, look for the most common errors, show you the errors, and then it'll give you options and pointers on how to fix them. Makes it really quick to go through your document and make sure you have the basic stuff taken care of. I have a question. Yes. So, uh, how do you um, mark mark uh, image as decorative? What what do you put in the? Oh, um, I can. Come back to that in a moment. Um, <laughs> no, but um, I, I, yeah, there's a couple different ways to do it. Um, so the question was, uh, how do you mark an image as, as decorative? Um, when you're in Word, um, there's actually an option. Uh, when you're adding, when you're in the the, the panel to add all the text, there's actually a checkbox underneath it to mark it as decorative. But that's not common across all uh, all systems. So you can also just put in, like, you can make the alt text decorative. Like literally the word decorative oh. or null or something like that. Um, just something to indicate that, okay, there's an image here, but it's not important. Yeah, I thought null just skipped over it all together. I think it depends on the screen reader, and I'm not oh, sure they all do. Okay. okay. Um, Does the screen reader read the title and the description in Google Docs? You know, you, you get oh, all, it, yes. and both boxes are there. I tend to skip the top one and just use the. Um, one. Actually, uh, okay. The, the question was whether in Google Docs, because when you're adding alt text in Google Docs, it gives you both a title and a description field. And do screen readers read both? Uh, that is an excellent question. I do not have an answer for that. I actually haven't played with that myself. Okay. Uh, so I don't know. It's the only honest, honest answer that I can give to that one. And you've given me something to play with when we're done here. <laughs> I, I have heard that you can just. You can skip the title and just do that's it. what I heard too. And I was just yeah, double yeah, I'm okay. yeah. So we have some okay. anecdotal evidence that you may be able to just skip the title and just go straight to the description, um, which makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, I haven't played with myself, so I don't know exactly how those yeah. work. So this is the accessibility in Google Docs. Um, it, there isn't an accessibility checker built into Google Docs itself, but Highline subscribes to a Grackle Docs uh, extension. Um, that should be available just by default within the extensions menu of Google Docs. You just go down to Grackle Docs and launch it. And then it will do the same basic thing. You'll get a sidebar on the side of the document window that will just go through and say, okay, here's the things you need to fix. Now, one thing I should uh, make sure you understand is that um, no accessibility checker sees things exactly the same way. No accessibility checker is necessarily going to be 100% perfect or entirely agree. Like there are things that Grackle Docs picks up on the, that the word accessibility checker does not. It's not really something to, oh, what are extension menus? Okay, <laughs> thanks, Helen. Um, there in, in Google Docs, it's, um, I, I have highlighted in red, it says extensions in the Google Docs menu bar. Um, you should have that menu, and then it should have Grackle Docs along with a, with a couple others underneath that. Um, if Grackle Docs is not there, um, get a hold of me after this. Uh, you can email me sometime, or you can get a hold of EdTech or maybe even IT. There, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's supposed to be installed by default, but there may be something you have to poke at to make sure it shows up. But I know that the Highline subscribes to that. The tool is available. Even if you might have to dig into a lower drawer of the toolbox, that's a horribly tortured metaphor. <laughs> okay, but again, 
Okay, got it. Excellent. Wonderful. Um, but again, um, if you're looking at a document in one program and looking at another, the accessibility checkers don't entire, uh, don't pick up on all the same stuff. It's nothing to panic about. You just uh, get the best you can. Um, and you know, if you're checking with something else to find something else, then go ahead and fix that too. You know, it's uh, um, it's there for much of this. There's a little. There's a certain amount of art in addition to the science. So checking accessibility in Adobe Acrobat. This is where things can get a little bit hairy. Um, and so I'm going to be a little bit brief here. Um, Acrobat does have an accessibility checker. Again, on the right-hand pane, um, there's probably, you should see a little purple accessibility icon. And if you click on that, you'll see accessibility check. Um, if you don't see the little accessibility icon, then uh, there's an Adobe, when you Adobe open an Adobe Acrobat, there's a tools tab that you can go into that has a bunch of add-ons, uh, basically optional things that you can put in the sidebar, and it should be in there and that'll let, let, let you add it. Um, Adobe Acrobat's accessibility checker is obtuse. <laughs> And uh, can both in the interpreting what it is telling you and in figuring out how to fix things. Um, there are still a number of areas that I'm trying to figure out. Or am I doing this? I'm okay. I'm good. Um, so I'm happy to work with people as you're as you're working if you are working with Adobe PDFs um, because uh, it's th th this is one of the larger headaches when it gets into accessibility checking, and I just want to be very upfront about that. Um, no document will be 100% accessible when first checked, and it may be that very few documents are 100% accessible at the end. Part of that is because there are some things, uh, some checks that Adobe runs that it knows they need to be checked, but it can't do it automatically. It requires uh, actual human looking at it and saying, okay, yes, this looks right. So any document you run an accessibility checker is going to have at least two errors just off the bat, and that's just because they have to be done manually. There may be more. There may be things that simply cannot be fixed. Basically, Acrobat, uh, Adobe Acrobat PDF files can be kind of a pain when it comes to this. We can make them as easy as, as good as possible, but which brings me to one of the things that I want you to think about as you're working is that does it have to be a PDF? I know a lot of us are in the habit of creating documents, locking them down into PDF format before we send them out. And there's a number of reasons for this. Anything from just, okay, I have the document looking and flowing and formatted exactly the way I want it. Okay, great. It's good to go and PDF locks it down. Other people might have concerns about uh, the document being changed by someone down the line and saying, well, wait, no, the document, the, the, the version of the file I have is different from this version of the file. And really the things I want to think about with both of those are, how big of a problem is that really? How big of a risk is that really? When it comes to the to the layout of the document and the flow, and yes, I totally understand that. I am very much in that mindset of I've got this document looking perfect. This is the pinnacle of what this document should be. Nobody should ever fight with it or do anything else with it. But at the same time, if you give them, if you give the students or anybody else a Word document, then all of a sudden you're you're, leaving, you're giving them agency that they wouldn't otherwise have, and they have they can do a lot more with that document to make it best for them. They can change the font to a font that is easier for them to read. They can change the font size from 16 to 18 to 20 to 24 to anything to anything along those lines to make things easier for them. They can change the colors. Maybe they do really well with yellow text on a blue background. Um, there's just so much more agency that they have. To make sure that they can get them the information as easily as possible. And if that throws off the formatting of the document, and all of a sudden you have line breaks and weird pages and uh, in weird places, and there's a picture that doesn't show up in quite the right spot, but it's close, then maybe that's okay. As long as they can get the information, maybe the little, little formatting weirdness is okay. And then when it comes to just locking the document down so it can't be changed. Again, uh, it kind of depends on the context of the document, but again, how much of an issue is that really? Um, if you as an instructor are creating a syllabus or a quiz and sending it out, and a student is coming to you saying, well, my Word doc doesn't say the same thing that yours does, who do you think is gonna win? <laughs> if you have the original document, you're the instructor creating that, I think it's gonna be fairly easy to say, no, sorry, 
That's not as it should be. Here's a fresh version of the documents just to make sure you have the right information. So, uh, and then of course, text text in Word, Google Docs on Canvas pages. It's simpler, it's more immediately accessible. As I uh, as I was talking about, it gives the students a lot more control over their reading, their over their learning environment, and and it and it saves you from all the, the headaches of dealing with PDF files. Not seeing questions at the moment, so I'll keep going. And then, then we get to the accessibility checking within Canvas. And Canvas actually has a couple different ways of uh, methods for accessibility checking. One is there's this accessibility checking icon um, that's just underneath the editing area as you're working in there. As you work, um, it'll pop up little uh, the little indicators as it sees things that says, hey, that could be a little bit better. Just keep an eye on that as you go. And then before you save a page, uh, if you click on that icon, it'll bring up the canvas will bring up a little pane on the right hand side saying, hey, you know, here's something I saw that can be a little bit better. Here's how to fix it. It'll jump you right to where you need to be to fix it. So that's that's kind of just the basic uh, uh, checker that's on every page editor within canvas. Beyond that, we have Allied. So um, the Highland Canvas installation goes the Allied Accessibility Checker. And this is, you may have seen this, it's, it uses the, the visual metaphor of basically like a speed indicator or a, 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 the little green numerals, green for very accessible oil, it'll, 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 like a fuel tank, it'll go down to lower percentages uh, for less accessible documents. Um, those scores are read, uh, visible when you're editing individual pages, or you can actually access an ally report for your entire Canvas course. So uh, the, when you're working on a page level, the accessibility meter is visible at the top of the Canvas page editing area. So just uh, uh, where the Canvas is built in accessibility checkers down the bottom, at the top, you'll see the little, uh, little indicator there, there from Ally. And again, um, I'm not sure that this, the Ally's checker updates quite as quickly as the built-in Canvas one. I uh, think it's um, from a very, and I will say very quick and not very in-depth bit of testing um, as I was putting my presentation together. Um, I'm not sure if it updates as quickly. It may work better on saved page after saving a page than as you're working, but it'll give you a rough idea of the accessibility. And if you click on that little meter, it'll say, okay, here are the issues I found. And again, you just click on those and it'll jump you to the right spot on the page to fix them. The, uh, the larger, uh, the more comprehensive check is the Ally Course Accessibility Report. This gives you an overview of the entire course's accessibility. So it'll reveal all of the Canvas pages, plus it'll also take a look at any documents you've added or linked to, um, and, and even uh, and videos for common accessibility errors. Um, and then it'll give you a list uh, at the bottom of the page of the, uh, the types of errors, how many have found, and you can click through quickly to correct them. So here's a, uh, here's a, here's an example from um, the test uh, test course I have in Canvas at the moment. So the Ally the course accessibility report um, it should be available in, your, in the sidebar on the left hand side of Canvas. You may need to scroll all the way down. <laughs> I think it's there by default. Um, if not, again, um, just talk to me or talk to EdTech and we'll figure out where it hides if, if it needs to be turned on or anything. But I think it's there by default. When you click on the course accessibility report, it opens this page for your course. Now it gives you the, the your basic uh, the basic score. Here I'm at 87 percent, which is you know not bad, um, but it could be improved. Gives you content with the easiest issues to fix and a start button. Low scoring content, so you can go directly to those. Basically, just gives you a good overview of how the course looks. And then scrolling down on that page. Um, it uh, lists out, okay, these are the issues I found with the course. So I have images that do not have alt text. They don't have descriptions. I have HTML with heading structure that does not start at the highest level because you're always supposed to start with two and go down from there. Uh, apparently I didn't do that at one point or another. Uh, contrast issues. Um, I didn't touch on this on the tips because I didn't want to get too in the weeds. So you want to make sure that there is good, contra uh, good contrast between foreground and background text so that people with, with vision issues um, uh, uh, can see things. 
And a quick little tip, if you use them, the default uh, PowerPoint templates that Highline's marketing department provides, unfortunately, they're very pretty, but they have very poor contrast. Um, the, the very bright green of the Highline logo against a white background. Um, so uh, you, um, you probably did not know this, but one of the things I've done in this presentation is I uh, changed that green to a slightly darker shade of green. So it's Highline-ish, but it's a lot easier to read. Um, you know, that's not the, to say anything bad about the marketing department. They're great templates. It's just, I discovered this as I was working on things. But in any case, it'll go through and they'll let you know, okay, these are the issues that we can, uh, that we found that need to be fixed. You can then click on any of these lines and it'll, uh, it'll, it'll jump you directly to uh, a more detailed list of which items fail for that particular issue. And then you can click through and go through item by item and make sure that those are correct. And that's what I have uh, for the presentation part. Um, so at this point, um, I, uh, my original plan was to you know go workshop style and ask people with documents or or anything that we need and maybe find some volunteers who would like to you know be okay with putting something up and checking it. If anybody would like to volunteer for that and have something, I'd be happy to do that because we have. Wow, um, I hope I didn't talk too fast for anyone. We have, uh, uh, looks like about half an hour left. Um, but I'm also I'm, uh, open for questions on any or all of this. Let's see what's in one online. And hey, I still have 13 people in the, so I only lost two people over the course of this. So that's pretty good. Oh, yep. <laughs> so I'll take that as a win. Yeah. <laughs> So I have a question. Yes. So if you're uh, formatting, if you're creating a document in Word, but you do want to PDF it, mm -hmm. um, and it's accessible in Word, does that accessibility transfer when you save it as a PDF? And, or how well? Yeah, okay. So the uh, question is, if you have a document that's passing Word's accessibility checks, does that transfer over when you save it as a PDF? And does it, how, how does that fare in Adobe Acrobat's PDF checker? accessibility checker. Um, best answer I can really give is, uh, you're, you're, um, first off, you're absolutely on the right track. Yes, you want to make sure it passes the word accessibility checker. That definitely helps a lot. The trick is, and um, there, there are at least, I think by default, three different ways of creating a PDF from Word. Some of which, will work very well for accessibility. Others are absolutely horrible for accessibility. Um, and so in the best case scenario, uh, there Word has a there's an Acrobat extension built into Word and it says save as save as Adobe Acrobat PDF. That is going to give you the best results. Uh, and it will be in, entirely or as as or entirely or the best possible accessible output as, as possible. Um, but if you do something like, I'm trying to remember what all they are. Um, I'm more of a Mac user for a Windows user. So it's very common on the Mac, if any of you are Mac users, to, uh, yes, Mac, yeah, Mac says print PDF. Uh, you'll just hit print, and then there's a little button at the bottom of the Mac dialog that says save to PDF. Absolutely horrible for accessibility. It basically strips out all of the accessibility information that you've been so good at putting into your document. So unfortunately, I cannot recommend that method. Um, uh, definitely use the uh, say to the export to PDF option that is built into that that is included in Word instead of using a print to PDF function. Yeah, and I think a lot of that, and just slightly peeking a lot of that is because when it says print to PDF, it really is going through the print process. It's not, and so it's just spooling the information out as if it was being sent to a printer. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That was a great nice one for it. Sure. So the camera doesn't point that way, but no, that's okay. We'll talk it through. So here's the header. Okay, so we're getting stuff, for those of you who are online, we're getting stuff put on the board that is 
out of view of the camera. So we, we will uh, uh, fertilize here. So this is about headers, and I think I had a basic misunderstanding about headers. Okay. So I so this is number one. Yes. And so now I've got big things and then small things. Yes. And there's stuff under here. So I would have put this at the two level, and this is the two level, and yes. this is the three level. Yes. But are you saying that this should be one, two, three, four? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. You're doing it absolutely. So perfect. this is right. Yes. So you, okay. Oh, okay. yes. Yes, it's about cascading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so even though you can repeat a number, oh more yes, than once. yeah, you can have multiple, okay. you can multiple header twos, multiple header threes, multiple header fours, as long as they cascade in the correct order, and you're not going directly from header two to header four, or four or five, or something like that. Now here's another one. Yes, Maria and I talk about this one a lot. We use a lot of screenshots, so we're building like reference sheets, uh -huh. either for teachers or for students. Do this, then do this, and do this. And we take a screenshot and put an arrow, click on this. So like what you were doing with yes. your red boxes, which is also works depending on what your building is, you can't always do that. Right. <laughs> so before, when we, a couple of years ago, when we were learning this, we were told to, in order to get the alt text, uh -huh. so here's the screenshot, and then we put an arrow pointing at it, then we need to take another screenshot of the whole thing, so we can do alt text of picture of a man with an arrow pointing at it, or picture of the Google Doc drop down menu with an arrow pointing at at gotcha. something. Yeah. So do to embed the arrow uh -huh. appropriately in a thing. Do we need to do that second step? You know what I'm trying to say. Yes, mm -hmm. there are different ways of doing this. Um, there's not a simple. Okay, so I'm going to try and summarize for example. Okay, um, a lot of it. Oh, a lot of it. Uh, a lot of it. Oh, sorry, uh, okay, yeah. excellent. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, hopefully that that makes sense. Basically, when it comes to um, putting things like arrows or boxes and stuff on top of screenshots, making sure that those translate correctly, there are a couple different ways of doing it. It um, like in like uh, I'm just going off the top of my head. If you were in PowerPoint, you could do something like. Just put a screenshot in, and then you can use PowerPoint's tools to toss a, a toss like a graphic arrow on there. Um, you can certainly you can that'll will certainly work. You would just need to do something like first off, use PowerPoint's um, ordering to make sure that the items are read in the correct order, and then um, you could do something like the the alt text for the screenshot might be screenshot of Microsoft Word words home ribbon and then you have alt text on the arrow itself saying arrow pointing to the page format option of Microsoft's home ribbon. So ordering through animations even though you don't need it to fly in? Um, it's not through animations there's uh, um, yeah there's it, and actually it's uh, when you go into PowerPoint's accessibility checker there's a uh, I don't remember the exact, exact term for us coming ahead but there's a uh, there's an option for checking the reading order of the slide. Yeah. Okay. And, and I think slides has it too. Uh, yes, yes, it does. I don't remember the exact terminology, but yes, slides has it as well. And it, and the reading order is very important. Again, as people are stepping through the slides, you want to make sure uh, they're read in order. And um, this can be very important in presentations because, especially as we're building presentations, we might not necessarily know everything that goes on to a slide as we're building it. And so we'll do this part, then we'll do this part, then we'll do this part, and then we'll move them around on the page. But we didn't necessarily put them in in an order that makes any real sense for the final product. And even if it, it, though it may make sense visually, because we we tend to think you know top to bottom, left to right. If you put them in in a different order, then PowerPoint when it starts reading could be just bouncing randomly all over the place. So the PowerPoint's reading order uh, pane is what lets you make sure that it's going through in the correct order for that. Um, however, you know, doing it the way that was recommended, and, and here it was recommended to take a screenshot, draw an arrow on top of it, and then take another screenshot. Um, that's essentially what I did for my screenshots in this presentation. Did. I did it slightly differently. Um, uh, I did it in Photoshop, um, uh, but I, I, I took a screenshot, brought it into Photoshop and drew my boxes and then exported that as a new graphic and then, then, then put that final graphic in. Photoshop? Yes, you do. And if you, I mean, Photoshop has a bit of a learning curve, but if you like, as Highline employees, you have access to basically all of Adobe's software. 
Um, Highline has uh, uh, Highline has a really nice contract with Adobe, and so you can just go to the Adobe site, uh, sign in with your credentials, your your Highline credentials, and then download and install Adobe software. So if you don't already have, like if you do a lot of work on your home computer and you want to make sure you have Acrobat on there to Acrobat Pearl on there to run the accessibility checker, sign in the Adobe site with your Highline credentials and download it. And and we'll find Photoshop there too. Yep. Yep. Okay. So Acrobat, Photoshop, basically, um, I don't know about all, but like the majority of the big name, most commonly used Adobe applications that you have access to. Let's see. Nothing more in the chat at the moment. Is there anything else? That is coming to mind. Well, I, I did, okay, I, yes. This may be for another workshop. Yes. But I just am thinking about Excel. Uh -huh. And if you use Excel a lot. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, that's a whole different thing. Yeah, Excel, I would have to do a lot of research. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that probably would be a whole other yeah. workshop because, um, but. I think, yeah, a, a part of it, though, is that recognizing that um, different tools have different purposes that they're good at. Word is a really good word processor. They've shoehorned a lot of um, page layout stuff in there, but it's not a great page layout uh, program. There are other uh, programs that are better for that. And while it can do tables and things like that, um, you, wouldn't want, you wouldn't want to use Word to do work you would normally do in Excel. And just the opposite. Excel is a great spreadsheet. It's not a very good word processor, but uh, we have gotten in the habit of, uh, of do, making a lot of forms and such in Excel because it's really easy to get them lined up and use the grids and, and get all that. But um, yeah, it, but it makes for but it can make for very inaccessible documents because even if you've hidden the lines. So that the the grid of the uh, the grid of the of the Excel grid is visible, the the table the it's all still there. So if you were to output that and try and read through it, you might still have a screen reader going, you know, row, whatever, cell, yeah. whatever. And if you're trying to read your way through a form that way, it's it'd just be horrible. Um, so yeah, a lot of it is just making sure that you know you're using a tool that more or less in the way it was designed. <laughs> Well, if there's nothing else, then um, sure, Mike. If there, if uh, if as you're working on making things accessible, I am always around for questions. Um, I uh, if, um, in actually in the description for this one, no, it wasn't description for this one. But um, if you go to the accessible technology website, or if you just look me up in Outlook, uh, the signature for my email um, has, uh, um, I do twice weekly Zoom sessions um, on uh, Wednesday afternoons from 3.30 to about 4.15 or when I run out of steam. Um, and then Thursday afternoons starting at three o'clock. Um, where you can just drop in, it's just an open Zoom lobby. I sit there and I wait to see if people will show up. Um, and I am happy to answer questions. And if you have problems or you're getting stuck, or I had the other day, I had an engineering professor come in and say, I've got this engineering diagram, which is, you know, X, Y, Z axes and a bunch of numbers and equations. And how do I write alt text for that? And I said, that's an excellent question. And we had a good discussion about that for about the next yeah. half hour. But I'm always available, and uh, the times are posted um, in a number of places. Actually, they're on the Accessible Technology website. They are on the LTC, the weekly calendar that's being sent out by the by the LTC. Um, so you'll get that in your uh, inboxes. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to answer questions. And now you can see, is it better for you to prepare syllabus on Canvas pages or Word? Which one is more accessible for our students? I would actually kind um my per, this is uh, at this point this is personal uh, preference, but I would actually kind of say that um I'm sorry no I said that backwards Canvas 
in large part because I mean, it's your you have these days. In my understanding, and I believe that my understanding is you have to have your syllabus on on Canvas anyway. So as long as the syllabus has to be posted to Canvas, why not just put it in a web page where again they have all the standard controls that it being that being in a web browser does. You know, they can increase the font size, they can decrease it, um, they can use read and write so that they can the read and write software that Highline provides students. They can use that to read their way through it, even if they're not a, a screen reader user. Why not just have it there where it's as simple as possible rather than making them click and download a Word document and have something else to keep track of. I will freely admit that's just my personal opinion. Um, I mean, either would work as long as it's an accessible document, but it just seems to me a little bit easier to just have it as a Kansas page. Mm -hmm. And we have a question here. Yes. Um, I agree in the accessibility of that, but I'm just, <laughs> I'm seeing, I'm, I'm a screen reader or, you know, yeah. text to speech, but I'm just thinking about general students who want to really want the paper and they want to download it. Mm -hmm. Can you print there? I mean, from the, the Canvas, Canvas page? page? Because it seems like maybe you could do both. Um, you know, yeah, both is an actually, yes. I, I should back up and just say both is an excellent answer to that, to the original question. Um, but uh, yeah, so both is a good answer, but you should. Uh, you should be able to print from Canvas pages. I mean, there's web pages like any other page. Um, yeah, I just didn't know how easy it was. To do. Yeah, um, multiple pages long. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Anyway, and it's gonna be it's like the old pages long, whether it's in Word or right. Canvas. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but uh, yeah, but yeah, uh, and again, both is a good answer. And thank you, Matt, and thank you, Mary, uh, for uh, for being part of this. Although I think they both left by now. But I'll say thank you. Right. They were saying thank you in the chat. Yes, yes, we're down to six. But thank you for those of you who are sticking around. And <laughs> uh, 12 is a, uh, that's, that's, well, that's chat. Yeah, right. that's chat. Yeah, 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 that's chat.